right. Thank you very much, LEP. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Nadia and Bill's study. Unfortunately, Nadia is ill. Uh, she lost her voice, so she mm -hmm. couldn't do it. So uh, she's doing okay. So she's fine. You know, just she's lost her voice. So she asked if uh, I could sit in for her and, uh, you know, try to keep Bill under control. So uh, wish me luck, everybody. But we're on page 25 today. Now we're we're in there is a solution. Now you got to remember that the title of this is there is a solution. These people knew of one solution. You know, if they knew of more solutions, they would have put there are numerous solutions, but they put in here there is a solution, one solution that they know about, and they're gonna talk about it. You know, one of the greatest slides that I ever put up that I enjoy is that this book is not the treasure. This book is the treasure map and it will take you to the treasure, which I, I, when I first saw that slide, I thought that is brilliant because it meant so much to me because, you know, if we do the work, we will get the rewards. If we don't do the work, or if we only go part way through, we're only gonna get part of the rewards. Okay, we might say silver for a short period of time. But if we go through and do what the first 100 did, we should get the same results. And that's what this is all about, is going through the 12 steps, getting our spiritual awakening, our spiritual experience, becoming to rely on somebody else instead of ourselves. Stop being so selfish and self-centered. You know, a whole new way of living. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. So right at the bottom of page 25. Bill, is there anything you wanted to say before we start? I start reading for you? you. You brought up a real good point when you said that. Because lately, because I've discovered the great reality is deep within, it's almost like I flip coins and I've been at odds with the great reality deep without, which is just a different myriad of agnosticism. And what dawned on me is the point of contact is on the inside. God is everywhere, everything, and he's a part of us. But we have to go inside to make the point of contact to have that experience. And like you said, treasure map, treasure, treasure chest, but I don't have to go anywhere. I have to do certain things because the treasure is deep within me, but I'm blocked from it, which is the solution they discovered is only one solution, Rob. It wouldn't matter if they said we had many, but I'll go back to one. The solution is access to the power. The problem is selfishness and self-centeredness, which is blocking me access to the power. So, no, that's good. Go ahead, read on. Well, you know, the, the, that, that brings us to another point, is that a lot of us, when we come into the fellowship, well, they think it's find God and everything will be fine. <laughs> if that was the case, then it would be a one-step program. Find God, and then you're you're doing, that's it. But there's blockages that are, are blocking us from our higher power. And we have to get rid of those blockages. Now, everybody goes, well, where is God? You know, how do I find him? Well, in 30 pages from now is where we're going to find that God is deep down inside each and every one of us which is a beautiful thought, but it, it, you know, Bill is bringing us along slowly. Okay? And I'm talking about Bill Wilson, not Bill Swan, you know, it's bringing us along slowly in order to, because a lot of us come in with prejudices that we have to sweep aside. Okay. We have to get rid of the old ideas that we have about what our higher power was or is, you know, we're taught from an early age that God is a punishing God. Don't do that or God will be mad at you. Don't do that, okay? It's a control, you know, we're taught that it's a controlling God. We're not taught that it's a loving God and that everything that he is going to do for you is for your benefit. If, and there is the condition, if you do his work well, if you do his work. So let's get starting. If you were seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle of the road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One, 
was to go to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could and the other to accept spiritual help. This we did because we honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. Go ahead, Bill. I want to say one thing interesting. We're on this paragraph. Me and a sponsee this morning were talking, and he was talking to his sponsee, and he was making a statement coming from a position of how seriously alcoholic we were. In the book, it says whether or not an alcoholic or a person can quit drinking on the basis of a non-spiritual uh, encounter depends on the extent to which he's already lost the power of choice in drink. Not every alcoholic, that means not every one of us that has the allergy, because that's what the doctor says, is the one ingredient that never occurs in the average or temperate drinker. It can occur in someone who's not so blocked from the power or has not drank themselves into a position where they can't stay sober no matter what. There are some alcoholics who come here who identify with the allergy. They identify that their over drinking has caused consequences and they come here and find a new way of life. And what was being stated to the to the grand sponsor, for lack of a better term, was you have to do this or else. And I said, hold on, we don't know that. Because if he's in and, and it was exactly what came out of what we were discussing today, the book says, if you were as seriously alcoholic, do I meet the description of the doctor's opinion? Do I meet the description and more about alcoholism? And ultimately, do I meet the description in the first paragraph and we agnostics? I know you'll do your due diligence to post that up, but in, in, in the interest of time, it says in the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. If when you honestly want to, that means you're not lying to anyone else because there's no one else left. You drank them up. You find you cannot quit entirely. In other words, I swear to God, I'm never going to drink again. And I mean it. Or if while drinking. You have little control over the amount. In other words, if you act, if you set in motion that allergy, and then one of my sponsors along the way said, "I'll give you one on the house or both." You have probably you are probably an alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering with from an illness, which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Not everyone that comes into this fellowship is as seriously alcoholic as those of us who you find are looking for the solution with the desperation of drowning men because they haven't gone to that degree of alcoholism. But be of good cheer if you're one of those who for right now can stay sober because you say so and come to meetings and find the herd instinct to be sufficient to overcome your desire for drink. Just remember this. We are in the grip of a progressive illness which means although I'm not drinking, it's still growing along inside of me. And if I ever get that insane idea that I could drink successfully, at least I know where to go in case I get in trouble again. You might find out that you're like our carpet slipper friend who was sadly mistaken because he was 25 years further progressed in this disease, even though he remained bone dry for a couple decades. So it's it's critical. But we can't impose our bottom, if you will, on someone else. Because if a guy's not desperate, there's no sense of urgency. I'm sponsoring a guy here who got out of jail. And the day he got out of jail, all his scorecards read zero. I talked to him and he was weeping. He was reasonable at that moment. He's on more dipping apps than I am Zoom meetings, which is hard to believe. And all of a sudden, he feels that social acceptability equals recovery. And there's no sense of urgency like there was only 50 days ago. And I'm kind of nervous because I get to the point where he might be, what do they call on Cameron's meeting? I don't want to go swear in here. I'll walk. A waste of effing time. I'm not going to pour into him what I would do for a guy who says, please help me, I'm drowning. You get what I'm saying? So it's seriously alcoholic. That's a big qualification, Robin. I don't think we talk about that enough. 
No, we don't. And because an awful lot of people come into the fellowship and they, they come in because of consequences. Whether it's a DUI, their wife is on their back, the work is on their back. They have different reasons for coming into the fellowship. They have no no thought of drinking. They might be a heavy drinker. You know, they're not an alcoholic. They come into the rooms, get everybody off their back. You know, they they enjoy the fellowship because, hey, you know what? The fellowship is great. We laugh. We have a great time, you know? So why wouldn't other people enjoy it? The problem is when these people start to sponsor, they teach people to do what they did because that keeps them sober. So, well, it keeps me sober, so I'm going to do that. But for a serious real alcoholic now bill uses different terms serious real you know just to to change words because people get and when they hear the same word used over and over again they get bored with it so bill was taught in his writing class to use different words okay and that's why we you know all through the book we'll have shortcomings uh you know and defects of character I mean exactly the same thing you know but Bill just wanted to use different words. Now, Bill also took us to page 44. And the two questions every alcoholic has to ask himself, can I quit on my own? And when I start, do I keep going, you know? But right now we're in the book and what Bill's trying to do is trying to teach us about alcoholism. What makes, a, what makes an alcoholic? Slowly brings us to that point. Now we're going to get into a certain American businessman. Top of page 26, everybody. A certain American businessman had ability, good sense, and high character. For years, he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. He had consulted the best-known American psychiatrist. Then he had gone to Europe, placing himself in the care of a celebrated physician, the psychiatrist, Dr. Young, who prescribed for him. Though experience had made him skeptical, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. His physical and mental condition were unusually good. Above all, he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. More baffling still, he could give himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. Bill, you want to jump in there or do you want me to say a few things and then you jump in? Uh, well, I mean, here's the funny thing. Sometimes I know what's going to happen at the end of the story, so I want to get there quick. But when, when I'm listening to you read it and I'm reading along, certain things start to come to me that I've otherwise missed many times, and not because I wasn't looking, it just wasn't revealed. Um, but as you know, and I expected you to say this, so we're talking, not only is this a story for our experience, this is part of the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. A very important part. The gentleman we're talking about here is. I'm surprised Rob doesn't have his whole autobiography posted yet. This is. I did. I just put in some. I just put in some pictures, but I haven't. Of course you did. Okay, so this is our good friend Roland Hazard. Roland Hazard stood to inherit a lot of money. Came from a very prominent family. They were involved in steel or canning or whatnot, and very wealthy. And he realized that he was an alcoholic. He had been into many uh, institutions, if you will, that's what they called them back in the day, asylums, whatever it was, treatment centers, rehabs, detoxes, had seen the best minds in America. And then what happens is we read the part where he placed himself under the great physician, Carl Jung. Apparently it's been said Sigmund Freud was busy or we become into AA talking about an Oedipus complex. So they would have him be with, with Carl Jung, who was a psychiatrist at the time, and had some such luck producing a moral change, moral psychology, they called it, in alcoholics. So he went there, and it says he inquired, he acquired uh, the inner workings of his mind, the mental, not the mental conditioning that preceded the first drink, but what would cause him to decide that a drink's good and now all of a sudden he's got springs and traps and what all these people coming out of the treatment centers in the 70s say are triggers which don't exist. Because if triggers were the problem, all we have to do is place ourselves in isolation for the rest of our lives and we get along just fine because most of us don't like people anyhow. 
that wasn't the problem and they didn't know it. So relapse was unthinkable, right? He could give himself no explanation. He got drunk on the way home from the hospital. And it was said, some people have quoted that he spent a year there. I think, Rob, you corrected and said it might have only been a couple months. Is that right? That is correct, Bill. But nonetheless, if you're separated from alcohol, if you if you medically detox between three and five days or whatever that term is, and 30 days later, and it wasn't just an insurance thing, the reason treatment lasted for alcoholics, but it didn't work so well for cocaine addicts because they discover what was in the brain was different. It went to a different center of the brain than did alcohol. When they were 30 days sober, alcohol was out of their body, mind, and spirit, at least in a medical situation. So to release them, they should get a good result. Hence, the treatment centers were, were doing 30-day rehabilitations even after detox. Well, he was there for that long or even a little longer. He learned everything. He liked the doctor and he had a great feeling. And now he's heading back to the States to live his life of opulence. And before he even gets back, he's drunk several times. Go ahead, Rob. I just painted a better story than the book quoted. Well, see, the couple of things that we, we have to realize. History is great to know. I love history. I cannot get enough of it. Finding out about all these people. But it's not going to keep you sober. Now, if you are only within the fellowship for a very short period of time and you're struggling with sobriety, the information I'm gonna we're gonna we're, we're talking about right now is useless to you. What you what if you're just coming in, you need to know about I'm, what am I suffering from? Allergy, phenomenal craving, and the obsession of the mind. That's what makes me alcoholic. Now, the history is great. As I say, I love it. Okay. Roland Hazard went to see Carl Jung. As, as Bill said, Roland Hazard went to see an awful lot of people. Courtney Baylor, you, you name any of the, the big names that you've heard about from the 1920s, 1930s. And Roland Hazard tried them all and nothing seemed to work. Now, friends of his had gone and seen Dr. Young and they had good success, not for alcoholism. They went to see Dr. Young for other issues. But they thought highly of Dr. Young. So Roland thought, well, you know what? Roland's a rich man. He can afford to, to take the boat from the U.S. over to uh, see Dr. Young. Now, Bill Wilson, in all his stories, talks about Roland Hazard, went to see Carl Young, spent a year with him. Roland Hazard did not spend a year with Dr. Young in 1931. Roland Hazard went in 1926, and he spent a couple months there. Saw Dr. Young, came back, got drunk. Then in 1931, he went back and saw Dr. Young. And that's when Dr. Young said, you need a vital spiritual experience in order to get better or to change. Because the whole idea is you need to change. We're selfish and self-centered, and we have to change. Because all we do is we think about ourselves. What do I want today? What can I get from Sherilyn? Okay, what can I get her to do for me today? You know what? You know, I need 20 bucks, Sherilyn. You know, can you can you loan me 20 20? You know, no. See, and that and this vital spiritual change. And Dr. Silkward talked about the same thing, is trying to change our mindset and the way we think. Instead of thinking about ourselves all the time, I have to start thinking about other people. What can I do for you today instead of what can I get from you today? And that's what they're trying to do. You know, unfortunately, Ro here's another great story about Roland. Roland also, there was a Dr. Cowles. And I put some uh, a little bit of information in the chat about it. He would drain spinal fluid. Thinking that there was what was causing alcoholism was the pressure on the brain. So he would, you'd go to his office, he would stick a needle in your neck and drain off spinal fluid. These are, now, there's a whole article and if you're really interested, I can just let me know and I can send you the article and you can read about it. it it's quite uh, interesting. It's interesting 
but it just goes to show the the, the lengths that Roland Hazard was willing to go to. You know, because the, they do mention it later on, way later on in the book. Uh, I think uh, in two employers, Hank Parker talks about he knew a guy that uh, had done this, and it's Roland Hazard. You know, it's amazing the lengths we go to in order to get better. Here, Roland, he's trying everything. You know, he thought so. He goes see Dr. Young, thinks self knowledge is going to keep him sober. Who else felt that way? Bill Wilson, when he went to Towns Hospital. Self knowledge will now keep me sober. Okay. The second time or the third time Bill was there, fear sobered him up for a short period of time because he thought he was going to be locked up. You know, he overheard Dr. Silkworth and Lois talking about, you know, Bill's going to have to be locked up put away forever. So fear sobered him up for a short period of time. But it didn't didn't keep him sober. You know, the, our thoughts, the obsession of the mind, our thoughts start, you know, going, oh, it's going to be different this time. Everything's going to be fine. You know? Roland is an incredible character. But as I say, Bill Wilson is the one that started, you know, he 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 never met Roland Hazard. Roland Hazard knew Ebby, okay, because when Ebby was in court, Roland was around at that time, and uh, Ebby ended up staying at Roland's uh, place for a while, you know, to try to get him straightened out. But if you even take a look at the, the letter that uh, Bill Wilson wrote to Carl Young, he spells Roland's name. R O L A N D, where Roland is R O W L A N D. So, you know, Bill Wilson had heard stories and repeated the story, like the broken telephone. The story gets made bigger and bigger the more it's told, you know. And so, instead of a, a couple months, he's he's in Switzerland. You know, it's a year of intensive therapy and stuff like that. And that's not the case because we have the the book. Uh, Stellar Fire by Cora Finch, who details and went through the books of uh, the Hazard Estate, and uh, five thousand and so many dollars were wired to Roland over in Switzerland. So, if you also if you want that story, let me know in the uh, chat, and uh, I'll make sure that you get a copy of it. It's fascinating reading if you're interested in stuff like that. But as I, I said a little bit earlier, if you're just getting sober, this doesn't help you. I think what, what this does do is it brings these people to life to me. You know, I know what Roland looks like. He's, a, he's an actual person. When somebody talks about Roland Hazard, I, can, I know what he looks like. I, I know, you know, I know this poor guy. Okay. Where other times, you know, if I don't have pictures and images, that's why I post all the stuff in the chat to try to bring these people to life. And so that instead of just thinking, you know, they're a figment of our imagination, these are real people that suffered terribly. And they're suffering, you know, they're putting their story, their experience, strength, and hope within the book in order for us to recover. In the, in the second uh, premise there, is once you get past the point where where Rob says, okay, this is intriguing, and if you're new, it makes for great, it'll help put you to sleep. And, and when I said this is part of the history and I didn't give the one ingredient, but you gave so much information, I'll introduce it now. Okay. When Carl Young told Roland Hazard, which Dr. Bob was inclined to believe but didn't know how to access it, and Bill Wilson had no idea, was that he needed to have a conversion spirit experience larger than anything that could be produced scientifically or medically. That was the premise. The other point of it, when you start to read this stuff, when you fall in love with Alcoholics Anonymous because it's affected a change in your life, or if you're on the outside looking in, but know that there's something there, when we see how this whole thing came together 89 years and two weeks ago, right down the street from where I'm at, you realize that there was a great Geppetto pulling a whole bunch of puppet strings 
And that gets you excited. And if you had difficulty in believing that there was a creator of the universe, a czar of the heaven, the great spirit, guess what? Your thinking might be changed. Like when I read it, it was fascinating. And hopefully we'll get into that. For the record, since we're being recorded with you and me here, Rob, we might only get a half a paragraph read today. Now you'll come back and think she didn't miss. <laughs> yeah. You're so right about that. So we're in the middle of page 26. So he returned to his doctor, whom he admired, and asked him point blank why he could not recover. He wished above all things to regain self-control. He seemed quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems, yet he had no control whatever over alcohol. Why was this? He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could never regain his position in society, and he would have to place himself under lock and key to hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. That was a great physician's opinion. No control. That's what he wanted. You know, when I first came into the fellowship, I came in with the idea thinking that uh, AA would teach me how to drink like a gentleman. That I would come in, you know, they would say, you know, Rob, you know, you, you drink too much. And uh, if you do this, this, and this, you'll be able to drink. You'll be able to regain control over that situation. That was my thinking. I didn't know any better. So people that come into the, to the fellowship need to be educated on what they're suffering from. Most don't know. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know I had an allergy. And do you think when I went to my first few meetings, it was speaker meetings that they talked about the allergy? No, they didn't. They talked about how much they drank, you know, and how many fights they got into if uh, they wanted to be a tough guy. Or they they would tell, you know, how much trouble they got into. Did they tell me that uh, they needed a spiritual experience in order to get well? No. No, they came into the to the rooms and all of a sudden everything got better for them. You know, so meeting makers make it. Meeting makers make it to more meetings. But the, the whole idea is that I can sit in a chair in the fellowship. I can go to the airport and I can sit in the departure lounge. I don't have a ticket. I have no luggage. I have no money. I'm not going anywhere. All I'm doing is taking up a seat in the departure lounge. That's like coming into the fellowship and not doing the steps. You know, we're sitting there, we're trying to get, I'm trying to get the knowledge of Bill. You know, I'm trying to absorb. Bill says some things and I repeat them. But I don't have the experience. I haven't done any of the work. Okay. I'm powerless. Powerless means you have no power whatsoever. If I have less power, I still have some power. But if I am powerless, I have no power whatsoever. But what does that mean? You know, and people come in and their first meeting and, you know, are you powerless over alcohol? Yeah, I'm powerless. Well, what, do, what does that mean? That means that I can't stop myself from taking that first drink. Why? I don't know why I can't stop myself from doing it. That's why I'm here. Please help me. Teach me. Okay. And this is what we got to get through to people is that, you know, we come to book studies and this is what it's all about is we keep hammering home the same point over and over and over again. Is that allergy, phenomenal craving. Once I take one, I can't stop myself. Two, obsession of the mind. My mind tells me that next time it's going to be different. Or this time it's going to be different. You know, it's like the devil and the angel on my shoulder. You know, the devil keeps telling me everything's fine. Okay, but I got the angel saying, well, you know what? You've got an allergy. Step one is that we, we, we admit to our innermost selves that we're alcoholic. What does that mean? That means I have the allergy that anytime I take alcohol into my body, I can't stop myself. I want the body wants more and more and more. And I keep going. The other part is the obsession of the mind. That my mind tells me that you're making too much of this. You're not a real alcoholic. You'll be fine. You know, Bill's going to buy me a couple of rounds and, and everything will be fine. You know, but 
that's not the case. That's what, what I talk about when we learn about what alcoholism is. And then on, on page 30, which we're going to be get to, well, we probably won't get to it today because I talk too much. But the idea is that we smash the idea that we can ever safely take a drink. So that when that idea comes out, wouldn't it be nice to have a beer? Well, you know what? I go, I say to myself, yeah, it would be nice, but I can't because the phenomenon of craving will kick in and, you know, but if I'm not spiritually connected, God, me, connected, relationship, okay? If I have a strong connection, my mind will be okay. And it, I, I will be able to say to myself that, no, I can't. I can't take that drink because I know about the phenomenon of craving, okay? But if I don't do the things that keep me connected to God, you know, by helping other people, by doing the next right thing, okay, my connection becomes broken. When does the obsession in the line come back and my mind will tell me that it's okay to take that drink and my mind will believe it? I don't know. I don't want to find out. Okay. Connection looks like it's broken from without. And the reality is, is that the, the breaking of the connection is within. Yeah. Sophie, they go for about 20 more minutes and then we take uh, raised hands for the questions. Is that okay with you? Oh, you got, okay, I got the thumbs up. And Rob, I want to uh, say something before we get into the next week and have to start back at the doctor's opinion. Read this <laughs> next paragraph and I'll share another thought that just came to me. Okay, you got it. But this man still lives and is a free man. He does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. He can go anywhere on this earth where other free men go without disaster, provided, did I emphasize that enough, Bill? Provided he remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. It's actually because I got uh, still caught up in our story, which is a phenomenal story, and I can listen to it over and over again. I was actually talking about the paragraph that you just had read previous to that. Oh, okay. And here's what he said. He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth as if the doctor wasn't giving him the whole truth. And then I remember what it's going to say in this book. Doctors were rightly low. They were hated and reluctant. To, it's a twofold word. One means low. I hate that. And the other is they were low. They were reluctant. They didn't unless it would serve some good purpose. Because if you got the diagnosis of what he was about to be diagnosed with, you were hopeless. Alcoholism was fatal. There was no, you, you would be locked up or permanently go insane because alcoholics were going into asylums and some of them were never getting out. So when the doc, when he asked the doctor for the whole truth and then it says he got it, in the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. But this man still lives and is free. And you're talking about provided he maintained a certain attitude. And what is the definition of attitude? Thoughts, beliefs, and feelings are pushed to, cast to one side. An attitude is, is my response or my belief and my thinking about something, right? It's not just I got a bad attitude. I have that as well. But that doesn't necessarily compel me to drink. If I think that you're the problem and I'm not willing to look inside of myself, that attitude's going to get me drunk, just like the same attitude that when I feel that there's a separation or a distance between me and God, all of a sudden I think he went to another country and left me all alone. All that happened is that prideful balloon of self and ego woke up and it gets real dark real quick. The good news about taking these steps and at least putting ourselves in a position where we can have that experience, the sooner the better. Because as soon as the experience starts to fade, I know that there's something the matter with my spiritual status. See, if I come here and don't drink long enough and go to meetings, I can deceive myself to believe that I found the panacea for alcoholism. And then when it gets dark out, which is really inside, I don't know it because I've never been exposed to the light. What I did is stop drinking and got a little bit of peace from that. The reason we had to have this spectacular alteration 
And they talked about it. They did it quick with the in the beginning because they were desperate, hopeless cases. But could you imagine being in the dark rock for 40 years and doing something and all of a sudden the sun shining brightly? As soon as it started to fade, you would do whatever is necessary to keep the light burning. You'd be the Motel 6, right? They kept the light <laughs> on for us. Thank God somebody kept the light on. And that and that's one of the things is that we have to remember, too, that, OK, the book was was published in 1939. A lot of these stories are from the late 1920s, early 1930s. Well, one was Prohibition, 1920 to 1933. OK, bathtub, Bill talked about bathtub gin. This is gin that was actually made in a bathtub, you know, by a bootlegger. You know, you didn't know what you were getting, OK? Some were getting raw alcohol and it would make them go crazy. So yes, some people got locked up because they did actually go crazy. You, then you have others that went blind because of, you hear about the moonshine nowadays, you know, and being made in the backwoods of Tennessee. Well, I've been to Tennessee. I've never seen a still, but I keep, I keep looking, uh, you know, for the craziness that goes on. But you have to remember the time period that we're talking about too. You know, there were no government regulations on alcohol because they weren't supposed to be making alcohol. Now, rich people like Roland Hazard could get his alcohol coming over from Canada. Okay, so I'm sure he wasn't drinking rot gut, as they call it, unless he was desperate. Okay. But, you know, Bill was drinking rot gut. Okay, bathtub gin that tastes so bad that the reason that you mix it with uh, pineapple juice and any other fruit juice was because it tasted so terribly. You know, but that's that's another story. I Bill off, wasn't but... drinking for the taste, sir. I can assure you of that. He wasn't. And one, and one more thing. If you remember from one of those Rocky sequels, when Polly yells out the window, hey, you sterno bums, knock it off. I have literally met people in AA who got sober in the 40s that talked about straining sterno and other things through bread when they were in a bottle gang. I wouldn't even know how to think like that, but that was what was going on at this time with regard to alcohol. They were so desperate. They would drink anything. We had a guy here in Cleveland who was sober for quite a while. He went out, picked up a drink, and couldn't get his hands on any alcohol. Rob, he drank antifreeze without filtering it, and he went blind, and it's almost like his whole body struck out. He walked like he was being led around. His feet were sliding. He came into a meeting about two weeks later, and I didn't recognize him. He drank his eyesight away. I mean, the, the things that are put in, when we see alcohol content with this alcoholic mind and the desperation for the drink, that has to be satisfied because of a craving beyond my mental control. I'm surprised that they have any of that hand sanitizer in meat. It's just like 80 proof. I know. Well, you know, I'll tell you how naive I was when I when I came into the fellowship. Is that uh, I have a, a a good friend uh, that lives up the street from where I am. His kids and my kids uh, were all around the same age, so they played floor hockey together, soccer, you know, all the different sports we would get, I would see them at that. And he was telling me about his mother and his mother was banned from drugstores because she was uh, drinking, rubbing alcohol. And I, I had never heard anything that crazy before. And then uh, they talk about mouthwash. And I used to, the one meeting I was going to, and one guy, all he, he smelled like mouthwash all the time. Which is nice, better than bad breath, but it's like, wow, that is so powerful. You know, it's like somebody that's wearing too much cologne. You know, like, just, holy jeez, that's an awful lot of mouthwash, that guy. High proof. And, you know, it's, it's these things that we learn, you know, like, you know, very, you the, city, know, the insidiousness of this. The insanity. Is I is I, well, I would, I would tell myself sitting here today in a position of abstinence, that I would never do that. I have no idea what I'd never do. There was a lot, a whole lot of other things I was never going to do that became, did them again and again and again. So 
mouthwash, vanilla extract, rubbing alcohol, uh, stuff under the counter in, in your house. Yeah, exactly. If it, if it showed a content of alcohol and they felt like they were going to die if they didn't get alcohol in and there was no alcohol, they'd try anything. But I'm telling you, they used to sift it through bread and they talked about the stuff that was in the, the heating cans, that sterno, which is some type of petroleum that has an alcohol base. That's what keeps it on fire. And they would strain it through bread knowing if they didn't, they were going to go blind. And hoping they strained it enough, but I was sometimes so desperate. I don't know if I'd be patient enough to let it strain. I might cut some corners and have a permanent effect on me. Well, that just goes to show the insanity of the first drink is that, you know, we'll, we'll take it just because we need alcohol in our bodies without thinking of the consequences because we need it. The insidious insanity of that first drink. But that's of the first drink. They're take that the insanity is they're taking that first drink from a position of sobriety. Yeah. What I'm talking about is once they start, anything yeah. goes. There's exactly. no telling. Yeah. Now, you guys on this channel, we are not as educated, and I won't mention any names of those people or historians. You are getting some information that you won't find in the book and probably not get from no, any of the other no. big book studies who weren't here 40 or 50 years ago. <laughs> some of our alcoholic readers may think they can do without spiritual help. Let us tell you the rest of the conversation our friend had with his doctor. The doctor said, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I've never seen one single case recover where that state of mind existed to the extent that it does not you. Our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed on him with a clang. He said to the doctor, is there no exception? Yes, replied the doctor, there is. Exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times. Here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. To me, these occurrences are phenomena. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements, ideas, emotions and attitudes, which were once the guiding force of their lives, of these men are suddenly cast to one side and a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. In fact, I've been trying to produce such emotional rearrangement within you. With many individuals, the methods which I employed are successful, but I have never been successful with an alcohol of your description. One? I think one more paragraph, sir. You want one more paragraph? I okay. do, because it kind of includes this, this thought. By the time okay. we're done, they're going to think they're talking about 15 or 16 different people. <laughs> okay. Upon hearing this, our friend was somewhat relieved, for he reflected that, after all, he was a good church member. This hope, however, was destroyed by the doctors telling him that while his religious convictions were very good, in his case, they did not spell the necessary vital spiritual experience. So, so, I'm sorry. One more time. One more. One more. Two sentences, sir. One more. Okay. Here was the terrible dilemma in which our friend found himself when he had the extraordinary experience, which, as we have already told you, made him a free man. Thank you, Rob. I'm glad you chose to stop there. <laughs> Thanks. First of all, I want to applaud you and thank you very much for what you said with your ambition for history is what it is, because I never knew that Carl Jung didn't specialize in a certain myriad of, of psychiatry that dealt with alcoholics. He had come across them. But had you not said that some of Roland's friends had gone to see him for other disorders that he was able to offer a remedy or a solution, it wouldn't have made sense because then well, why would Silkworth have been the specialist? Having said that, the amazing part about this story is Roland, is, is he gets the diagnosis. You are of the type that I have come to regard as hopeless. I've, ne I've never seen, he hadn't witnessed an ability for him to bring about the change that he had done in other alcoholics that weren't as seriously alcoholic as Roland, but he had heard, right? He said here and there once in a while. 
Roland said, is there no exception? And then he gets a little hope back when Carl Jung says, yes, here and there once in a while, alcoholics have had these stirring spiritual experiences, which have changed them from the inside out. And Roland said, great. I was a vestry man in the Episcopal Church. And Carl Jung basically said, you're screwed. That information is not experiential. And what happened was, when he explained to him that here, and he said, well, what was that about? He said, these alcoholic types that you meet the description of have placed themselves in a spiritual atmosphere. They called it religion. And here's what else I learned. I'll pass it on. Religion and spirituality was synonymous back then. Not like the definition is today. When they were using the word religious conversion or spiritual awakening, it was a synonymous term, Rob. That's why he said in there, he told them, there have been people who have placed themselves in a religious atmosphere, and they've had this upheaval, this total rearrangement. And, and Roland says, I must have that. Where can I find it? And that's where the hopelessness came in. Carl Jung said to him, I don't know. And in that book that you and I both love, Bill W., the first 40 years, he said, you place yourself in that. At if you can find one, you place yourself in that atmosphere and you can only hope. He couldn't guarantee if he found the, the garden. He got back to the Garden of Eden. He wasn't so sure that he could get back in the gate to have it removed. The only thing he could do is hope. And what happened then is the beginning of AA is he entered into the Oxford group and a whole bunch of pieces of puzzles started falling into place. And I'll say one more thing because we were studying in depth the doctor's opinion yesterday. And they were talking about the letter that Silkworth wrote to us. And then the first, you know, and everyone's talking about, oh, yeah, Bill had this experience and Dr. Silkworth gave us this letter. And I said, time out. The letter came out in July of 38, the first letter. The second letter was 39 to go into the big book. It wasn't just one example that Dr. Silkworth had observed before he gave us the referral or the recommendation. By the time 38 came along, Bill, who had been in his hospital three times within a year, and several others have had that were able to duplicate. What's that? Four times. Right. Was in town there, four times. Okay. Yeah. Previous three times he failed. Anyhow, he knew he was a chronic returner to the drink. But Dr. Silkworth wasn't writing the letter because here and there once in a while, what had happened is Bill was able to take this approach with some misgiving from the doctor, and the doctor was aware that something had taken place that was able to be duplicated. Or we would have had a letter from Carl Jung that said, hey, Roland Hazard had this spiritual experience, and this will work for alcoholics of his type. That's why the letter wasn't written before that. But you had to be there in this discussion yesterday to understand the premise. But yeah, it's just it's interesting to follow it up. And when you said that he wasn't a specialist in alcoholism, that makes perfect sense. What what I like out of this is the the whole idea is the ideas, emotions, and attitudes which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men are suddenly cast to one side, and a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. The whole idea is we have to change. We have to be in so selfish and self-centered and a new set of ideas overtake us. And until that happens, you know, if we don't change, we keep doing the same things over and over again. Okay. As was it Einstein that said, if nothing changes, nothing changes. You know, if you don't do anything different, you're going to get the same, you're going to do the same thing, get the same results, if that's what you want, you know. But the, the whole idea is that, uh, you know, because these doctors, you know, remember, Dr. Silkworth did not have a lot of success in treating alcoholics. It's not like he, his uh, record of uh, recovery was, you know, 75% or 50%. You know, they were taking people detoxing them, and then 
you know, for in five days and then send them back out. You know, in uh, Hank Parker's story, The Unbeliever, he talks about that he went to Towns Hospital 10 times. And then we have another we have another story in the book, and he was there six times. I think it was Jim, the car salesman. Uh, I, th I believe he was in six times. And each time they went, you know, Bill would go see him. You know, so they would dry you out and send you on your way. You know, Bill went four times. You know, but he, but the last time, you know, he had put together the whole alcohol puzzle of what, what is the problem? What is the solution? What is the course of action? Then he had to put it into practice. So let's, we've got a few more minutes, so I'll hit another paragraph for you, Bill. We, in our turn, sought the same escape with all the desperation of drowning men. What seemed at first a flimsy reed had proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. A new life had been given us, or if you prefer, a design for living that really works. Bill, I'm going to stop right there. Do you have any final words? Because it's a design for living, and, you know, what's the name of this? There is a solution. So, yeah, what you said, I like his writing at the beginning of this chapter. We talk about we are like passengers the moment after a great rescue from a shipwreck that was going down. And here it says, he comes back to that, we in turn sought the same escape with all the desperation of drowning men. What seemed at first a flimsy read, so there's really no answer, but we're going to try this because we, we try. The reason we don't believe there's an answer as desperate is when you keep trying things that don't work and you go back to the abyss, you start to lose hope. In fact, the doctor's opinion says our problems pile up on us, becoming astonishingly difficult to solve. We lose faith in ourselves and even in humanity and even in the power. However, have we not wasted so much time with all our great history, which may or may not have anything to do with this reading, but we had a ball. That'll be, that. that's what you get, Nadja, for taking off. Um, that if you get into the next chapter, where it talks about it, the same thing takes place. The desperation of a drowning man is usually the catalyst for getting every alcoholic to this destination called AA. The problem is the desperation subsides for a couple reasons. Number one, I quit drinking and the consequences are the, uh, the, my problems that were astonishingly difficult to solve all of a sudden I could solve them. I might be a I might be a bear of a guy. I might be very restless, irritable, and agitated when I'm doing it. But I'm not under the influence of booze or in a drunken state that I can't show up. And the second and probably most important is the recuperative power of the alcoholic ego. And what comes back after a few weeks of me being sober is I don't miss it at all, feel better, work better, having a better time. Inwardly, I would give anything to jump into a bottle of whiskey because I can't stand crawling in my skin sober. And that's what takes place. That's why people come in and you're almost convinced with, with as badly mangled as they appear to be that you know they'll do anything to lift this merciless obsession. And no one's more surprised than them when they go back out and pick up a drink because they either were unblocked momentarily, or at best it was a temporary surrender, which had no lasting effect. And then they had no effective mental defense against the first drink. And they convinced themselves, part of the disease, I suppose, that because they were able to stay sober for three weeks or three months, they'll be able to do it again if they ever get that bad. It's just, what an insidious disease. It uses our own mind. I was thinking about it. It's like I got conversation going on in my head between the liar, which gets me to take a drink, and the guy who's almost lost all ability to recognize truth. Neither of those mindsets have the ability to do anything but get me in trouble. Because like in the movie The Shining, take away alcohol, give me no substitute, and all work and no play makes Billy a dull boy. I'm done, Rob. Thanks very much, Bill. Appreciate you. And we'll close it out with the serenity prayer. 
And if you want to unmute and follow along, or if you want to say it just for yourself, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference.